If you would, and if you are able, we stand for the reading of God's Word. Our reading today comes to us from 1 Thessalonians, beginning with chapter 1. Uh, we'll be reading verses 1 through 10 to get started with. Let's see what God's Word has for us today. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example for all of the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The Word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here today be worthy and acceptable in your sight, O oh, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're going to spend the next few weeks exploring the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians together. And uh, to help us with that, uh, you may have noticed in the bulletin, I kind of listed out the readings for the next few weeks. Uh, and so if you would like to, in your own time of personal devotions, if you want to read ahead and kind of get the story in your head and how the, how the Scripture unfolds, uh, then that may make our time together in worship a little more fruitful as we call our kind of working through this book together. So Thessalonica uh, was a uh, city that was in Macedonia, as it was referred to uh, in the New Testament. Now it's a region in Greece. And this would have been a church that Paul and Silas would have planted in their second missionary journey. Uh, so we read about the events of their coming to, the, to the Thessalonians uh, in Acts. It would be chapter 17, I believe, and there are only about nine verses or so telling about when they came and planted the church there. Uh, we're told that they uh, they came to the town, and though it was primarily a, a Greek outpost uh, or a, a, a Gentile, uh, of, uh, they uh, there was a synagogue there, and so as was their practice, uh, Paul went first to the synagogue and proclaimed among the Jews there for several weeks that Jesus was the Messiah that they'd been waiting for. And he sought to prove the necessity that, that Jesus needed to suffer and die in order to bring about God's plans. And so because of their ministry there among the Jews, uh, some of the Jews came to faith in Jesus Christ, and even more Gentiles uh, came to faith as well. So the church was planted there in that place. And yet, shortly after that, we're told in the book of Acts, uh, the, some of the other Jews there in town began to stir up trouble for them. They turned the city against uh, Paul and Silas, um, thinking that they were troublemakers. In fact, it's right there in Acts where we're told that it's, it's here in, in Thessalonica that uh, the, the Christians were accused of turning the world upside down. And what a wonderful accusation that would be, right? Uh, to, if, and perhaps even in our own day, for such a broken world as we live in, I think Christianity needs to be turning the world upside down again. So this is where it happened among the Thessalonians. Now, uh, Paul and, uh, and uh, Silas were driven out at that point. They had to shorten their stay and move on to the next town. But the, pl but the church was established and continued. So this letter that we're reading here today is actually a letter that Paul is writing from Corinth, kind of farther along on that second missionary journey. He's now writing back to that church to kind of check in with them and to, to, to kind of talk about how things have been going since they left. Now, 
Paul in his letter, this, this letter kind of unfolds in a similar way to most of the letters in the New Testament. There was kind of a, a Greco-Roman form for letters that Paul seems to have adopted for these. It would begin with a, a short greeting, right? That's the to and froms uh, the, right at the beginning. And then there would be kind of a, a thanksgiving or a prayer or a blessing that would occur kind of in that first section. And that's the, what we just read to begin our time here together today. And then from there, they'd move on to the body. And in the body, Paul would uh, kind of mix his time between uh, theological teaching and, and, and straightening out perhaps the errors or the misunderstandings in the community, and then also the, the practical parts of what does it mean to live out your faith? How should you be practicing your faith? What does that look like in action? And then, of course, it would wrap up with kind of a, 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 a personal closing, uh, personal greetings to people within the community, and that's how the letter would wrap up. Now, um, What's interesting is uh, we have just read uh, the, that Thanksgiving portion uh, that Paul began with. And within this Thanksgiving, Paul is kind of highlighting quite a few of the, the themes that he's going to be addressing throughout his letter. So he's using this thankfulness as a way to kind of get these in front of the people. So we see that he's thankful for the way they uh, received the gospel when he was there. He's thankful for the way that gospel transformed their life. He's thankful for the way the gospel went out from among them, affecting even other communities. Um, and uh, it's interesting, he puts in there at the very end just kind of a, a brief sentence which points to what is going to be a major theme uh, in the, the first letter of uh, Thessalonians, which is the return of Christ, uh, the, the second coming. And, and so he kind of unpacks all of those themes before them, and we're going to be getting into all of those in the weeks ahead. Uh, but for today, where we're going to begin with uh, Paul's reflections on the way they delivered the good news to the people in Thessalonica. So, I'd like to dive into the second chapter, if you will. Uh, it's, uh, it'll be up on the screen if you're following along. We're going to read uh, uh, the first 12 verses here. Now, you, yourself know, you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you, believers. As you know, we dealt with each, with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you would lead a life worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. So, Paul begins by talking about uh, their, their experience, their shared experience when Paul and Silas first came to them. And, and of course, he, he speaks about how the relationship began. Uh, they came to Thessalonica right from Philippi. And if you remember the story of, of Paul and Silas in Philippi, uh, it was a time of very fruitful ministry for them, but it was also a time of, of great suffering for them. Uh, the crowds had turned against them. They'd been arrested. They'd been beaten. They were thrown into prison. And um, so, so, so they'd been through all that, and finally they were set free and told it was time to get on the road again. And so, coming out of that experience and then coming uh, to the Thessalonians, they were bruised and beaten, 
Um, uh, but they were still set on doing the work that God had called them to. And so they dove right into the ministry that God had called them to uh, among the Thessalonians. And, and so he also reminds them of the, the way they delivered this good news to them, uh, the way they went about doing that. And Paul does this in kind of an interesting way. You kind of hear this back and forth between, we didn't come to you like that, we came to you like this. Not like that, but like this. And he's setting up a contrast here, right? And, and that contrast is interesting because it almost feels like Paul is addressing some accusations that have been thrown at him about his conduct. Whether people are talking in general about the way Paul is in these various churches, or whether it was specifically uh, people talking about some of his uh, misdeeds among the Thessalonians. Uh, but, but, but if they were direct accusations or not, Paul seems to be addressing it directly, saying, look, you know that's not who we are. Let me remind you of what it was like when we came and how we proclaimed the gospel to you. And so he names some of the things that they didn't do. We didn't come to you in deceit or trickery or under uh, false motives, right? Uh, you know, when you have a message that you are trying to convey to people, you're trying to convince them of the truth of it, trying to convince them to take hold of it, it is very easy to cross the line from persuasion into manipulation, right? Uh, this, this message is so important that you want to convince them that sometimes it is tempting to use deceit and trickery just to get it out there, to, to get it across. And Paul says, no, we didn't do that with you. We proclaim the Word as we had received it to you. He also says that we did not come to you with flattery or seeking praise from you. Uh, they were not there to make a name for themselves, which actually was fairly common among uh, traveling rabbis, traveling teachers, traveling philosophers there in those days. They would go from town to town to make a name for themselves. They wanted to get themselves known and their new ideas and their new way of thinking, they, they wanted that to, to build them up and their ideas. And, and again, Paul says, no, we did not come there seeking your approval. To, we did not come seeking your praise, um, nor did we come for any kind of earthly benefit for ourselves. He says, we, we, we did not come uh, in greed. We did not come demanding an apostle's due from you. And, and it, it's not necessarily clear what Paul is referencing there. It seems that the, the role of the apostle was important enough in those days that it was expected that a community of faith would take care of the needs of that apostle while they were there. Um, and, and when Paul says that he did not make that demand, I don't know if he's speaking just specifically of there in, in Thessalonica that that was the case, or in general, maybe that was something other apostles did, but he never requested, uh, uh, you know, the, that, that kind of care from the, uh, from the congregations he served, or maybe it was contextual. Maybe he knew there were some congregations where he could trust that they would take care of his needs, and I, I think we're talking about like room and board while he's there, maybe even financial gifts for the, the journey forward, uh, or, or maybe He just left it up to them. I'll minister in this place, and when God moves their hearts to gratitude, then they'll naturally take care of Him as an apostle. Uh, but He makes it clear He did not come there making demands of them. In fact, He said, I, I, I worked hard while I was among you to make sure that I was not a burden on anyone. And well, that's a theme that we'll see in other places in Paul's work as well. So, Paul says, I was none of those things. I did not do any of those things. That is not the way I came to you. So, how did Paul come to them? Well, Paul uh, asserts, first of all, that he was there to do God's work. Um, this was not to uh, throw his own ideas out there, but to proclaim the message that he had received from God. So, he was not seeking the approval of man. He was not seeking the approval of that community. He was seeking God's approval. So, Paul and Silas, when they approached this work, it was not a matter of seeking success in that place. It was pursuing faithfulness, because if they knew they were faithful to the call that God had given them, then God would provide the success that they needed in that moment, right? They just needed to be faithful to proclaiming the Word of God as they had received it. And again, it wasn't their message. This was God's message that they were proclaiming, and so they needed to be faithful to this message. Uh, they knew that uh, if they explained it well, if they gave the reasons why they found it convincing, they didn't need to use deceit or trickery to get their Word out there. They simply had to proclaim it to the best of their ability, 
and they knew that God would help that message land on the hearts of the people. Uh, God would be the one who would convict the hearts and help the people to understand it and, and turn their hearts to Him. So they, they proclaimed the message and they trusted that God would do the rest. And yet at the same time, it becomes very clear that it was not only about the message here. Their ministry was not just a set of ideas that they were trying to convey to others in hopes that they would believe it. Uh, their, their ministry was one of compassion. Uh, they, look, look at the way they talked about their relationship with the Thessalonians. They said, we were gentle with you like a nurse is with her children, uh, caring for you in that way. You were dear to us and we loved you and showed compassion. We, we urged you and encouraged you the way a father would direct their child, right? And so, you see in all these different ways, Paul's saying that this was more than just a, a, a preaching gig for us. We were actually involved in your lives. We cared for you. We wanted to see God's best for you. And I think it was because of this compassion that, that Paul and Silas had for the Thessalonians, that's what made their message so compelling for them. Because they not only heard the words, they not only were able to reflect on whether this was true or not, but they also experienced the love of the apostles, which helped them to see the words with flesh on it, so to speak. They were able to see the words in action. They were able to see that, that this message, this gospel changes people, and it was compelling for them, and they wanted more of that. And so, the grace of God uh, came into their lives, and they, 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 they received the gospel. Uh, and, and as Paul says uh, early on, uh, I think it was in the first reading, he says, you did not just uh, receive the gospel in word, but you received the gospel in power and in spirit and in conviction. Now, when uh, Paul speaks of, of power and uh, in spirit in this moment, um, it could be that he's speaking of supernatural manifestations of God's work there. There could have been healings that happened. There could have been deliverance that happened, maybe signs and wonders that were done uh, in their presence as the gospel was proclaimed. Now, we definitely see this happening in other places. Acts records the apostles doing great wonders uh, that, uh, that help them to communicate uh, their work. But, but we don't see that in the story of the Thessalonians, so it's certainly possible that it happened. But we do know that an even more important and perhaps less fantastic work happened, uh, so to speak, that, that they were all convicted by this message and they experienced a life transformation, which was the most important piece of it. Uh, the, the signs and the wonders are, uh, you know, they're wonderful for conveying the work of God, but what really mattered was the internal transformation that happened to the Thessalonians. They were convicted of their sin, convicted of the truth of the message they'd received, and they were reconciled with God. They experienced this gift of reconciliation, forgiveness, and salvation. Now, because of this, they experienced a, a profound transformation. And, 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 uh, and like I said, whether, whether that was supernatural signs and wonders or the conviction of the heart, we don't know, but we know that it was tangible. People saw it. People recognized that there was a difference among these people. In fact, Paul says that they had become imitators of him. And what he meant by that was Paul had brought the message of the gospel to them, and they received it. And in turn, the message of the gospel was now going out from Thessalonica into the other communities. Uh, throughout Macedonia, other cities, other communities were hearing about the gospel now through them. And so they were becoming imitators in a sense that they were becoming examples for others. Others were seeing their faith and, and how they had provided for, for Paul and Silas and, and the, the other missionaries. Uh, their faith was on display and was, was being talked about by the other communities. And so basically, their witness was having an effect on the communities around them. And, and honestly, this is what discipleship is all about, right? Paul proclaimed the gift to them. They received it. They proclaimed the gift to others, and they received it. This, this is what discipleship looks like. We become imitators of, of the rabbi, of the one, uh, uh, Jesus primarily, but also the ones who have passed it on to us. We learn from them, from their words, from their life, and we begin uh, to take their model as our own, and we live that out so that others can experience it as well. So, this is what he was referring to uh, in the beginning when he said they had become imitators of him so that they could become a model and example for others. But he uses that word imitator or imitation in another place as well. 
And I want to read just a few more verses to wrap up uh, this section. Um, I'm beginning uh, with verse 13 here. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the Word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's Word, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things uh, from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displeased God and opposed everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Thus, they have constantly been filling up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has overtaken them at last. So, Paul here is addressing one of the major challenges for the Thessalonians, and that was that they were already facing persecution. Even as a a young church just getting started, already they were experiencing uh, persecution from the world around them. And so, Paul is saying, you have become imitators of uh, the other churches because you are experiencing the same suffering that they're experiencing. And in particular, he lifts up the churches of Judea and the way that they were being persecuted by the Jews. The same Jews that had, had handed Jesus over uh, to be killed uh, were the same Jews that were now persecuting the church. Now, again, I want us to be really careful in the way we're reading and understanding passages like this. I talked at great length about this last week, uh, and uh, so, so hopefully you already understand where I'm coming from on this. When Paul is speaking of the persecution of the Jews, he's not speaking about all of the Jews in this, uh, in this situation, because he himself is a Jew as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Most of the early Christians were Jews, so he's not speaking of Jews in general as if they're all bad people and they're all out there. What he is saying really is, is that the persecution was coming from their own people. So think about it like this. He says the Judean churches, who were primarily Jewish converts to Christianity, were being persecuted by their own people, the Jews. And in the same way, the Thessalonians, who were primarily of Gentile origin, were being uh, persecuted by their own people as well. And actually, it doesn't say whether they were Jew or Gentile, most likely because the church was kind of a blend of Jew and Gentile out there in Greece. So, so, so Paul is not necessarily throwing all the blame on the Jewish people in general for all the problems that the church is having. What he's saying is it is so heartbreaking that we face this kind of pushback and persecution from our own people from our families, from our friends, from our community. It's not people out there that are persecuting the church. It's people that we know and love that are making it hard to be a Christian. It's something that, that I think even we can probably relate to at some times within our lives. And so, Paul was reminding them, you're imitating the rest of the church in this way, in that you are experiencing the very same things that, that Paul has experienced, the very same things that many of the churches around them have experienced, honestly, that all of Christianity has experienced from the beginning of time, that whenever the people of God are getting busy with the work of God, there is always going to be pushback from the world. The world is always going to push back against any kind of gospel work. And so, honestly, the real question for us is, if we aren't experiencing persecution, does that mean we aren't doing the work that God has called us to? So, Paul is trying to encourage them in the midst of this persecution not to give up, not to lose heart. And and actually, he'll dive a little bit deeper into this theme in his second letter uh, to the Thessalonians. Um, In that letter, he will get to the question of why. Why are the Christians suffering persecution? Why is God allowing this to happen? And he offers a little bit of insight on this. Because first of all, he says that while God is not the one who causes this suffering and this persecution, God will certainly make use of your suffering in your life to bring you to maturity. God will make use of the hard things that you have to go through in your life in order to bring about a transformation in you so that you become more fully a son or daughter of God because of what you've been through. Again, not because God did these things to you, but because God took the things that happened to you and turned them into something good and beautiful for your sake. Uh, He'll also get to the justice question. 
He'll say, God isn't just allowing these people to do this without any consequences. Uh, He points forward again to the end of time, to the return of Christ, saying the people who are doing the persecution will be held accountable for their actions. They will stand uh, before the throne of God in the presence of Jesus Christ and have to answer uh, for what they have done. So, in these different ways, Paul is trying to encourage uh, the Thessalonians in the midst of the hardship that they find themselves in. And it makes sense because when you start encountering that kind of pushback, that kind of persecution, that kind of suffering, it does raise questions, right? You begin to get discouraged. You begin to wonder, did I choose the right thing? Did I make the right decision? And, And I think that's the reason why Paul is taking them back to their beginning. Remember what it was like in the beginning. Remember how you received this gift of God's grace with rejoicing, the kind of transformation that you experienced, the joy and the wonder at being God's people. Go back to that. Remember that because that's what's going to strengthen you for the hard road that is ahead of you. Well, I think in the same way, we as Christians are also called to be imitators of Paul, uh, in this sense, imitators of the early Christians as well. We have received this gift of God's grace. The gospel has been delivered to us, and we have received it. Um, And and because of that, we are called now to be models for others. We are called to let that gospel extend from this place, from our church, out into the world so that others might hear it. In our own lives, we are meant to live out our faith in such a way that we can communicate the gospel to others as well. So, in the same way that Paul was praising the Thessalonians for doing this work of proclaiming the good news, God is also calling us as the people of God to live our lives in the same way that our life might deliver the good news to those who are around us. But I think we could take probably the same warning uh, from the the book of Thessalonians uh, in regards to the fact that there is a good way to proclaim the good news and there are not so good ways of proclaiming the good news. Um, And often what this comes down to is a question of motivation. What is it that motivates us to reach out in the world with the good news? And I think this is a place where a lot of churches, a lot of Christians stumble, right? Because sometimes our motivations just aren't the right motivation. Think about it from the perspective of a church. Every church wants more members, right? Why do we want more members within our church? Why why would most churches say we need more members, right? Some would say, well, you know what? I look around and there's still empty seats. This room could be more full. And when a worship service is full of people, it's just more glorifying to God and more edifying to me. Or to put it another way, I enjoy worship more when there's more people in the room glorifying God. That's more exciting to be a part of something like that. Or we may say, well, you know, church, you know, it takes money to fund ministry, right? And we have financial needs. And you know what? If we had more members giving more resources, we'd have more money to do the work of God adequately, right? Or to rephrase it, if we had more people giving, then maybe I wouldn't have to wrestle with God's challenge to become a better steward, uh, more generous with the resources that He's given me. Or maybe we think, well, we need more help around here. There's more ministry that could be done. We need more people, more bodies, more gifts that can, that can participate in that work to do God's work more fully. Or to put it another way, I'm getting tired of either doing the work that the, the church needs me to do or constantly being asked to do the work, and we need more people to come in here to take that load off of me. You see how easy it is for some of our motives to become pretty selfish pretty focused on me and my experience and what would make it better within the church. Now, some would say, well, do the motives really matter? Because if the motives are bad, but they're still driving you out into the world and sharing the gospel with other people, isn't it, isn't it still good that we're doing the work, that the work is getting accomplished? And I'm not really sure that the ends do justify the means. I'm also pretty sure that bad motivations rarely motivate us to do the right thing or really to do anything. Right, because uh, the, the wrong motives often just mean that we're not really motivated to do it. Maybe we talk about those things, but when it really comes down to it, we're not really doing a whole lot of work of outreach. So what is our motivation for doing God's work? Well, I think our real motivation should come from a remembrance and a, and a recognition of just what God has accomplished in me. I mean, when I, when I recognize that God has brought me from death to life, 
from brokenness to restoration, from, from being condemned before him to being reconciled with my Father in heaven. When I realize just what God has done for me, there's a sense of gratitude and celebration of, of what I've received, and I begin to look out at the world and realize there are some people who haven't experienced that. They haven't experienced the joy of that gift within their life, and there are many people who are suffering trying to make it through life without God in their life, without a community of faith in their life, and you know what? I'm moved by compassion to, 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 to offer this gift to them, right? And when we're motivated in that way, then we really can't help but share the gospel with others. We are full to the brim with the grace that God has given us and just looking for an opportunity to share that with others. And so, if we're not in that place right now, well, then maybe we need to come back to our beginnings. Maybe we need to reflect a little bit more deeply on what exactly God has done for us. Do you remember a time before God was at work in your life? Now, some of you grew into this faith at a pretty young age. Some of you guys came to this later. But do you remember a time when you were apart from God and what that was like? And do you remember when God's grace first broke into your life, when God first got your attention, do you remember who God used to accomplish that work? Some person in your life, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was a parent, a family member, a friend, or who was it that God used to first speak this grace of God into your life? And what was it about that person or about that message that really got your attention? that really made that message land in your heart and made you desire a re relationship with God? And, wh and what was it like for you to first receive that gift of God's grace, to feel His presence in your life, to know that you were forgiven, to know that you were in right relationship with your Father in heaven? When did you first experience that joy of knowing that you were a child of God? What was that like for you? And how has God moved in your life since then? Can you point to the ways that He's grown you in your faith, the hard times that He's helped you through? Can you point to the ways that God has grown you up in your faith? Now, all of that was enough to get you to this place today, this place in your life, so to speak, but also to this place so that you saw this taking an hour out of your week to praise God as something that you wanted to do. Right? All of that work of God brought you to this place. The question for us to consider is, is all that we've experienced from God enough to now send us out with the good news? Is it enough that God has done? Is what God has done in your life, is it enough that it's now driving you to carry that same good news out to those who have not experienced it, that we might deliver the good news to others? and others might experience this grace that we've received. Let's pray. God, we do celebrate your work in our life and in our church. God, uh, sometimes it goes unnoticed, it goes unremembered. And so, God, just recall to, to each one of our minds the sweetness of your grace at work within our lives, and help us to give thanks and have gratitude for the ways that you've worked within us. God, we do pray that you would just fill us to the brim with your grace, with your presence today, that as we go forth from this place, we might have compassion on the world around us. God, there might be someone in our life right now that needs to hear some good news, that needs to hear about the saving work of God. And God, I don't know who it is, but, but you know what? I know that your Holy Spirit can bring that person to mind for each one of us. Who is it in our lives that you're calling on us to be a witness to? And God, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit now, that we might go boldly, willing to share from our own experience so that others might hear and understand the good news as well. We pray all these things as we offer our lives up to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the words that he first taught us to pray.